This program has been made possible by the generous support of the Women's Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the McCormick Foundation, Zero Divide, the Stewart Foundation, the Nathan Cummings Foundation, and the California Endowment. Oh boy, yeah, we go TV, we back here. Youth culture, youth voices, youth power, coming at you. What's happening, we go TV out here? Before we go any further, I have to pick up the magazine. You gotta look at Youth Outlook, the chronicle of young people's lives in the Bay Area. No, all over the Bay and beyond. Got a lot of good stuff for you this time. Yo! Hey Yo TV, this is Jasmine A, and I'm here to bring to you another episode of Yo TV. On Yo TV, we document youth culture in the country, in the world, pretty much everywhere. And on this episode, we're going to take you to some places in America that might look real foreign to you. So our first story comes from Russell Morris, who's a Yo journalist, writer, and he's traveled to a town that used to be indigenous territory to Mexico, where people still live there who were there when it was Mexico, but now there's a fence running through their country, and it's U.S. territory. So he's just going to talk to them about what life has been like before and after the border was put in place. Driving down dusty roads with a punishing sun overhead, it seems almost lifeless. But this region is home to the Tohono O'odham Nation, a tribe of 25,000 people who have shared the land with the roadrunners, mountain lions, jaguars, and wolves for over 6,000 years. In 1853, the U.S.-Mexico border was redrawn effectively cutting the Otum Nation in half. This border itself did not present grave consequences for the tribe, however, until the late 1990s, when the U.S. Border Patrol developed a new strategy for border enforcement in the Southwest. At that time, Operations Gatekeeper in San Diego, Hold the Lion in El Paso, and Safeguard Arizona in Nogales shifted enforcement to urban areas. The object was to force migrants into desolate desert regions, where they would either be deterred by the terrain or easily apprehended in open spaces. The only thing that's changed, however, is where migrants are crossing. The narrow corridor that they have been edged into is right to the Tohono O'odham Reservation. This land is also where the proposed border fence will be built, isolating the communities of O'odham people on either side of the fence and threatening the animals and vegetation of the biologically diverse Sky Island region. Tribal members and environmentalists in the region are not concerned with the politicized issue of undocumented immigration to the United States. Their concern is the preservation of the culture and habitat that have flourished here for thousands of years and now face decimation by the construction of a wall. Every October, Otum tribal members make a pilgrimage from the U.S. side of their land to Magdalena, Sonora in Mexico as part of their annual St. Francis Festival. The procession is part of a larger event with music, food, and dancing and is their largest tribal festival. Increased border enforcement in the past 20 years has restricted this movement, but they still make the annual procession until this year. Ophelia is a tribal elder, and she has watched the impact that increased border security has had on her people's land. On the 2nd of October this year, someone cut all the electrical lines uh, to all the autumn uh, communi the community, which is the community church, uh, com the community kitchen, and all the homes and they felt that they uh, couldn't do the ceremony. My brother decided that he was going to come across to the United States and try to get some generators and still have the uh, celebration. But as what he was coming across the border, he was shot at. Uh, his truck was shot at, and we don't know who, who actually did it. We kind of suspect it's the same people, the drug dealers, you know, uh, trying to take over our community. Aside from the aggression from smugglers, She's had to endure harassment by Border Patrol officers and restricted movement on traditional routes. Ophelia tells the story of one Border Patrol stop that turned into terror for her and her family. She was with her daughter and grandson, driving home from an all-night dance when they were pulled over. And they pulled us over, and right away they said, get out, get out, because I was in the back seat and I'm brown skin and don't talk English too well, you know, and, and so uh, I said, you know, what for, you know, and they said, I'd have to say that I was a U.S. citizen or a Mexican citizen. And I said, I'm an autumn, you're on my land, you know, I'm an autumn. Don't you know you're on my land and you, you should have some respect? At this point, Ophelia recalls, the officer got angry, unclipped his pistol, and put it to her head, demanding that she say whether she is a Mexican or a U.S. citizen. 
He said if she didn't answer, he would handcuff her and have her deported. And I said, where are you, you going to deport me to? Mexico is my territory as well. My father's community is there. All them communities are in there. By then, my daughter's crying, my grandson is crying, and, uh, and I can't cry because I'm really angry, you know, but I'm very much afraid, you know. At this point, another Border Patrol truck pulled up, and the agent put his gun in his holster. They were promptly let go. Beyond the abuse and the fear, Ophelia is most troubled by the prospect of the construction of a fence. The terrain in this corner of the continent is referred to as the Sky Island Mountains. The name alludes to the natural phenomenon of lush, vegetated mountains surrounded by a sea of desert. It is considered the most biologically diverse region in North America, connecting desert, tropics, and mountains. Matt Scroach is the executive director of the Sky Island Alliance, a nonprofit organization which dedicates itself to the preservation of the region. It's one unique biological region that spans the international border. And so in that sense, it's very much connected. The Sky Islands to the north of the border are connected geographically, topographically, biologically, ecologically with the mountains south of the border. And it's imperative that permeability of the landscape remains so that our, that our web of life, our plants and animals, are able to migrate back and forth over over short periods of time, but also over long kind of evolutionary time periods as well. Sergio Avila, a wildlife biologist for the Sky Island Alliance, uses the example of the jaguar, an animal native to the region, to explain his position. And it's not going to be a matter of, well, what side is the jaguar in? Is it in the U.S. side? Are we going to keep it in the U.S.? Or, are we going to, or is it going to stay in Mexico? It, it, it is not good to leave it in one side or the other. We shouldn't have to choose for the animal to do those things. I made a statement saying that it was like a knife in our mother, you know, and it's uh, these metal things that are going to go in our mother and we can't pull them out. Okay, so our next story is called Strength, Resilience, and Tradition, and it's about a young man who's living on a reservation in New Mexico, and he goes to a conference that they brought out there, the Equal Voices Campaign, and he's really just exploring this different gathering of people to share ideas and try to give equal voices to his community. Mobilizing a movement is a long-term process. This campaign, your town hall today, is all in, under this effort of creating a movement called the Equal Voice for America's Families campaign. It's about action because it will create a national platform by families and for families to address the issues and concerns that they have. If we were able to address, make progress in developing ways to promote a healthy lifestyle, would that significantly help us identify my creator or spirituality? How many people would say yes? And how many people would say no? It's a yes. My friend, he said he was going to some conference and, and he just asked me if I wanted to come into it and just check it out, you know, because I've never been to something like this. Okay, suppose we were able to stay productive. Americans for Indian Opportunity developed a process that is really based on the um, traditional wisdom of our Native American ancestors and we call it the Indigenous Leaders Interactive System. We have developed that in a way that working on traditional properties and created a modern uh, system of decision making really based on consensus and full participation. Each of the participants' contributions are uh, phrased in, a, in a, a short statement that's easy to uh, record in the computer. Once it's captured, we go around and they have an uh, opportunity to explain it a little further, a little in depth to the group, so that the group ha becomes a collective understanding of the meaning of that statement. So I'll give you a few minutes to think about mm -hmm. this personally, because this always helps me just to write it down, write what you're thinking a little bit, and then we want to capture it in a brief statement. I was just like the follower, you know, like I was getting sent to prison and some really good friends from California that I, that I met in a ceremony, they bailed me out. And they invited me to live with them under the roof to get, my, get on my feet. I've been back for like seven months now. There was a family emergency and so I'm back in 
I'm helping my brothers, you know, I'm encouraging them to move with me to California and get a job, you know. We're like, we live like 100 miles away from the, the city, the town, and out there you're stuck in the rest. No, no job, nothing. The only way to, to get away from all this, this trap life is to go out and go far away and start new, you know. If you want it bad enough, you do it. Lack of employment, uh, lack of school. Uh, there's just hardly anything, to be honest with you. You know, there's this the desert that you deal with every single day, and I'm sure that will stress anybody out. And with him, I think that's the reason why he writes. He tries to look at life at a, you know in, a, in another different angle. People get trapped real quick, you know. Good people, people that never took drugs. Um, other people be pre-pressuring them and they get into that and once they hook on that and they, they go on doing it and sometimes in life they'll get to a point where they just feel like giving up and they just switch to dead they say. I was really hooked on drugs and I didn't really care about anything. That's how I felt. Then when I compare it with the other person that's drug free, you know, they they got a dream, they try to go for it, and they try to stick with what they got. The first time I got into poetry, I, I was inspired by this song. This person that came to the school to give a, like a talk you know, to the students. So I started writing and I kept doing it, just stick with it. You know? I try to talk about what I'm trying to do, and even though it has a lot of cussing and a lot of F words. It still was spiritual when you listen to it. They got a native flipping off the world. Look into my bloodshot eyes. A young native wanna rise to surprise. As I pray every day, look into the sky. Hoping to see a vision. Hard headed me, I can't listen. I had no problem with teachers, but I did have a problem with the students. They wanna test you or something like that. I guess the way I look, you know, I didn't back down. I always stood my ground and it was a mis probably a mistake because yeah, I went to 11 high schools. Cuba, Crown Point, Puntada, Albuquerque, um, Bernalillo, Wingate, Gallup, Arizona, Rough Rock. Yeah, then the last one was California. I learned a lot out there on my own. Got my own house, my own job. I went to school there. I got my GED there. I used to be always getting into trouble and until I started staying productive, until I started self-disciplining myself, I learned that you can stay out of trouble that way. From my experience, I'd be like, I helped my family today and I'll be feeling good about it. I wrote this today and I'll be feeling really good about it. Somewhere in here. Oh, it's right here. Keeper, no? oh, US Airlines. Here, wait. <laughs> That's my first flight right here. And I wrote that right there. It says, it's time to rise like the airplane up in the sky sipping purple magic on the side i'm getting high struggling every day mad because my family's barely getting by my oldest is uh his name is jared he's um 22 years old and then i have twin boys they're both 20 years old one of them has a baby, and then uh, Roderick, and he's 19. And then I got Perry, who is 15. And Lorena, 11 years old. And Herbert III is um, nine years old. And then I have a 13-year-old named Hayden. And then my youngest is uh, six years old. His name is Jerry. My hopes for my children is I'm hoping that they would all graduate from high school, go to college, find employment not for them to be around here, because there's nothing here for them. Oh, the pitfalls, is mainly it's the transportation, I think, the, the transportation and the wages. When I was working, it just seemed like I was just mainly just working just for gas. Just, that's just like, becomes kind of pointless at uh, some point. Oh, I go around to people where they have like wild horses and I, I train them. I know the horse song too, the traditional horse song. Oh, some are wild, that black one can ride. That black one rides, I just, I just barely broke that. Just 
uh, a couple weeks ago. I love him, man. Every bit about him, man. I grew up with these since I was his age. I've been riding a horse on my own. Since I was Jerry's size, I've been. When, one night, I was, I was still a little, I was still a little kid. I just barely learned how to walk. Somehow I walked to, to the horse curl where all the wild horses went. And the stallion, the head stallion, was guarding me when my mom was trying to get me. She was like, that stallion is already getting pissed off at my mom for she was. So that the horses, they kind of took me in as they one of their own. Loose le... Loose le... Oh boy! Oh! You do the saliva of the horse. You, this way it won't hurt me. It won't hurt me. Oh. This is where their strength comes. It neutralizes them with the tail between the legs. That's where it neutralizes them. This is my pride and joy, man. If it wasn't for this, I'd probably be in jail or doing something bad, but this keeps me here. Ooh. Ooh, boy. Ooh. His mom, his mom froze to death in, inside the corral during she was trying to give birth during the winter time. So she died just right there. So he was, he was still like a, he was kind of like an orphan. So he has no mom, no dad. Or, that's why he's special. Ooh. Ooh, boy. What I love about horses the most is when they start to trust you, it's like, they're just, these are, they're just like little kids, huh? You gotta teach them. Like what, what you would say to your little brother is just like how you're teaching them. It's just the mainly, it's just for not to be scared of nothing. There's a spook for a while, then you show them that it's okay, then it's okay. My great great grandpa taught my grandpa, then taught me. So I gotta have to pass it on. That's where that horse song comes from. My great grandpa, his name was Tom Sosi. So he was, I don't know, he's just like the, the founder of all this. Huh? Wanna jump on Jerry? Okay. Oh, well. <clears throat> oh boy. Oh. <laughs> Well, I've been trying to get a job at the uh, BLM in, in Nevada so I can stay with the wild horses every day. That's just like paradise, man. All, the, all I would take is just my saddle and this and... I mean, I got my stuff, man. When do I start? <laughs> so I don't want to say this, but my dad used to be an alcoholic person and uh, I wanted to get away from the abuse. And, and I went and signed up myself for placement students. And I got placed with foster family in Salt Lake City. And I was out there with a foster family since I was uh, eight years old to 14 years old. My family wanted for me to come back because they thought that I was um, like becoming more like them. And they didn't want for me to get away from my traditional ways. So I understood their point of views and I I did not say um, I don't accept or anything like that. I, I do accept uh, our traditional way of life. I believe in it really greatly. And I came back home, my dad goes, I know why you left. He goes, I'm not gonna do that to you no more. And he kept his word for a very long time because he realized that by me getting, out of, getting away from here, he realized why I was out there. And I wanted that for all my children too, but they stopped that program a long time ago. And uh, I was unable to share that with my family. My son, Roger, he knows what's going on out there. And his brothers, they don't really know what it's like to be on their own. And he's experienced that. It's hard for a person to um, adapt to something a little bit different, and he knows that. We talked to the Creator. Bless us a good day again. That we could go on, go on. Yeah, living. It's mine. It's 
Maybe somewhere we will get help again. If you look here, what you guys decided by your voting, the one idea that you guys thought had the most influence, if we were able to get this done, is identifying my creator or spirituality. The computer keeps track of how the group decides on whether it's influential or uh, not as influential. Once you compare them and you vote which one has a significant influence, the most influential come to the bottom and you see more underlying uh, causes, more d a deeper logic, a deeper meaning. And the ones that float to the top um, tend to be more symptomatic. Um, and, and uh, are greatly affected by the ones at the bottom, but not vice versa. You gotta stay productive. And if you're staying productive, you feel good at the end of the day. I was surprised that they actually voted on my word, you know. They actually voted of what I had to say. And I never got to speak to some people, you know, like a, a group of people. That's what I never had. And yesterday was my first time. And it was a, it was crazy. <laughs> I was kind of like shy and, you know, I was kind of choking and I was like, oh man. I never met tribal leaders. I never actually got to get near one. And here I was sitting next to them. And that felt really good, you know. I felt like one of them, you know. I felt like I was just one of them. <laughs> All right, so this story is about a young woman who found sanctuary in horses. After her father died, she was on a rocky road for five years, as she explains, and she's really gonna tell us about how horses essentially brought her back to herself and saved her life. It took me about 30 years to get here, but uh, seven years ago, I became certified to teach equine guided education, which very basically is incorporating horses into human development, human self-development. We have both a nonprofit wing for uh, youth at risk and groups that want to come out as well as public programs if someone is working on some transition in their life or I've had people come out that are uh, going through grief and loss and they're working with the horses in that way or they're developing um, uh, a, a business plan or um, uh, as Holland was talking about making a declaration for change in some way and calling in something that has heart and meaning. My dad died when I was 15 and ever since then I've had you know really rocky unstable inconsistent uh, lifestyle. Um, I have been on my own for a majority of that time not living with parents not doing the normal uh, everyday thing that kids do. And I was traumatized by my father's passing and I ran away. And uh, I hopped around for a good five years. And with that came a lot of, you know, drugs and whatever else I did when I was young. Two years ago, I changed my life and, you know, have been moving in a better direction. But six months ago, I was in a breakdown and um, I called my mom and I was like, you know, I'm just, I'm tired of struggling. I'm tired of uh, feeling at the mercy of everything else, victimized, that kind of thing. Everything's happening to me, you know, instead of producing what I want to happen in my life. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mom said, well, you know, what? let's look at what has always made you happy. You know, ever since I've been a little kid, animals have been the thing that just light me up. They just make me, no matter if I'm in the worst mood, I've ever been in my life, you put me in front of an animal and it's like, you know, that all just washes away. Well, one of the very first dreams I had about my dad was we were in my backyard and he was like, he did, I don't even think he really said anything to me, but the communication was, this is your horse. And there was this huge white horse standing in front of him. And me and this horse just were like running and like frolicking with each other and just like in love with each other. And my dad was standing up on our deck just like watching us. And it was just like, he gave me my horse, like in my dream. And this is years before I came out here. Well, I didn't come out here thinking I was gonna find a horse or that I was, you know, I knew that I had a great connection with animals, but it wasn't like I had ever had any sort of connection with a horse. 
he was super sweet, but at the same time, like, strong. He was that, like, a rock, you know? He was my rock, and he was so sweet, and he, it was like no matter what was going on in my life, if I had stress at home, if I had, you know, pressure to do things, whatever, it, it was like when I was with him, all of that just, like, disappeared and went away. And also, he gave me the strength to know that I could face those challenges that I had in my life. He would let me hug him, which is like, you're not supposed to really stand in front of a horse because they'll, you know, they can hurt you, they can trample you if they get spooked or whatever. But I would get this hug with him where I would just stand right in front of him, just put my arms around him, and he would just stand there. And it was like, I mean, I have promised myself that I'll never forget like what that feels like because it was just like the deepest connection between the two of us and our hearts were like right there next to each other. And like when we let our horses out, we turn them towards us, towards the gate, and then we unhalter them. And, and normally they just turn and, you, you know, gun it for, for their friends or for the herd, you know. But he would sit and stay and stand there until I said, okay, it's okay for you to go. He had a disease called navicular, which is like a debilitating disease in joint, their joints. It's joint yeah, it's a, it's a joint disease. And he had it in three of his legs. He was only seven, which is really young for a horse. Um, but it's navicular is caused from like being started too early. Their bones don't get to grow. They had to put him down. The worst part was that I got really sick like two weeks before or a week before and I was scheduled to come out here, but I was really sick and I couldn't, so like I didn't get to say bye to him. So like that was my biggest part of it was like, and my dad, like when he died, I didn't get to say bye to him either. So it was like this whole like reoccurring, like everything that dies in my life, like I don't get to say bye to, you know? So it's been extremely hard and I miss him every day and I cry about him all the time, which is like, it's hard. Trust is a huge thing and, um, you know, the confidence thing and, I, and, and learning how to, uh, learning what your center is, learning what your passion is, learning what you want to do with your life, your direction. Um, they really show you that because if you don't know, if you're unsure of something, you're, the reaction from the horse is going to be completely different. So it's like they really, you really have to know what you want and what you're, what your intention is in order for these animals to respond to you. So I think that they show you, you know, what your real passion is in life or what you really want. You know, that's the biggest thing is you got to want it. That's it for your TV this episode, but make sure to tune in and catch us next time. You can also check out our website, www.youthoutlook.org, where you can find more stories, more me, more everybody. Go there and tune back in. All right, thanks. All right, so we're back from the bank. The bank. <laughs> and stay tuned, and there's a lot of more that are cut to the All right, thank you for watching Yo TV. Stay tuned and tune back in back next time and watch us again. <laughs> All right, well that's it for this episode. <laughs> okay, okay, okay.